Hi, I'm Emily Childers. I'm a PhD student in the English department at Florida State University. Um, I do mostly research in Asian American literature and media, and um, I'm a former student of Dr. Robin Truth Goodman. I'm Robin Goodman. I'm a professor of English at Florida State University, and we are here today to talk about my book, Promissory Notes on the Literary Conditions of Debt. Can you tell us a little bit about how the book came about? As I said on the very first day of class, when I wake up in the morning, I usually try to think about what is making the world so messed up, and that should be what I write on. Back when I began thinking about promissory notes, there was a bunch of issues surrounding debt, national debt, international debt, housing debt, credit card debt, student debt, that I thought needed to be linked, especially as debt was so clearly reliant on already existing social inequalities that were also important to think about. This was right on the back of the financial crash of 2008 and the response of Occupy Wall Street. And the late great David Graeber had just published his now famous Anthropology of Debt, which we read some of in class. Having just completed a book on militarism, gender for the warfare state, one of my thoughts at that moment was how debt is linked to militarism and authoritarianism. And we've recently seen the repercussions of that. Then I heard Juan Gonzalez's speech about the Puerto Rican debt crisis, where he argues that debt replaces the military as a colonizing force. And I wanted to see how the connection between militarism and debt informs literature, even before it can be directly articulated politically. So speaking of those connections between debt and literature, um, you know, it doesn't seem very obvious at first glance. Why should we look at the economy through a literary lens? In the 2008 crisis, words were spinning around to talk about financial instruments like credit default swaps, derivatives, and mortgage-backed securities. Understanding such words as composite identities, it became clear to me that these so-called instruments derived as literary character. What I mean by that is that the way novels have developed the idea of character since the 18th century as a composite of social types or averages. I started to notice other crossovers as well, like how debt was a type of representation of negative value or absence, which is also something literature achieves. In the work of Mary Poovey, whom we also read in class, I discovered that because of this representation of a positive value that did not exist as a thing, literature and economics also had a historical overlap and in a moment in the 19th century when they were separated into different fields. According to Poovey at the time, Literature served as a pedagogical device to teach people to understand finance. That is, how something not there could have value. We see this now as well in say a text like Adam McKay's 2015 movie, The Big Short, which was adapted from Michael Lewis's 2011 Chronicle. I can definitely see all the ways that debt has come up in kind of the modern era, but I remember being super surprised by how much time we spent reading some of those Victorian texts. You know, the first chapter of Promissory Notes focuses on the late 19th century, whereas the second half of your book analyzes post-colonial texts after decolonization. What links those two moments for you? Both of these moments are times of enormous financialization and also of enormous social inequality. I argue in the book that Anthony Trollope's 1871 novel, The Eustace Diamonds, is really a pedagogical novel that is trying to explain to the Victorian public how value can be created without referring to landed property or solid objects, but rather to instruments, letters, laws, contracts, wills, and agreements. The diamonds are an invisible object, both there and not there throughout the text. I wanted to raise the question of the relationship between this ethereal object, both there and not there simultaneously, and the financialization of the British colonies, a question that the novel also raises. The symbolization of debt as negative value through the diamonds allows the colonies to come into relation with the global system as a negative value. That is, the geopolitical system recognizes decolonized countries only as unequal and negative identities, as indebted. 
In the second chapter, I think about how the post-colonial writers like Soyinka and Megugi have tried to play with, resist, or reverse their identities formed as essentially indebted as negative value. Emily, let's turn to you. You took the class and have told me that it influenced you and you still think a lot about it. What are the ideas in the class that you found important? I had really never thought about how much the language of debt was baked into how we talk and think about almost everything in life. I think what really stuck out to me the most was how morality had been so closely tied to the question of debt. You know, if you have debt, you pay it or you're a bad person. And that's been the narrative for so long, but why? You know, why is one's position as a debtor tied to one's character, especially now when it's almost impossible to escape debt in some form or another? You know, as Lazzarato, who we read in the class and you cite in your book points out, as citizens of a country, we're already born in debt. Um, so it really just gave me so much to think about. 